Welcome to our Prophetic Perspective podcast. Today with me is Marlon Ming. Welcome, Marlon. Hey, it's nice to be here, Reinhardt. Yes, I'm a Reinhardt Stander, and today's topic is the, the deception. deception of dispensationalism. This is episode eight, and this is quite a journey we've been on, yeah. and we need to put on our seat belts. Yes. You know, to many people, this may be shocking, but please bear with us and please follow along. And so the overview for this podcast is world events, people's perspective, theological perspective, prophetic perspective, and perspective of hope. Section 1, World Events. Now, as far as our world events, we have an uh, article here by ABC. So this is not just some offshoot article. It says some pastors wonder about the end times, and this is directly relating to the war in Ukraine. So this is what they're saying. One of the most detailed alerts came from the televangelist Pat Robertson, who came out of retirement on February 28th to assert on the 700 Club that Russian President Vladimir Putin was compelled by God to invade Ukraine as a prelude to an eventual climactic battle in Israel. Robertson said verses of the Old Testament book of Ezekiel uh, support this scenario. And those together will be making up this tremendous uh, army in the latter days. And I, I think you can say, well, Putin's out of his mind. Yes, maybe so. But at the same time, he's being compelled by God. He went into the Ukraine, but that wasn't his goal. His goal was to move against Israel ultimately, and he'll link up with Turkey. And so, you know, what is very interesting to me, you know, when they refer to Pat Robertson, and then we can see what he says to him, uh, you know, t what he says to his audience yes. that God did it. And so what, what Putin is doing, he's yeah. putting on God. Mm -hmm. that, that is just very interesting to me. But uh, dispensationalists believe uh -huh. that Israel will be attacked by Russia, mm -hmm. according to Ezekiel 38 and 39. And today, with our guest, we will study Ezekiel 38 and 39 and see, is this the Biblical. Bible prophecy and should we be interpreted like that? And um, if we interpret Bible prophecy... You know, should we come to the conclusion that Russia will invade Israel? Mm. You know, we will listen to our guest today and see what he says about this. Russell Moore, public theologian at the evangelical magazine Christian Today, said it's wrong to try to connect world events to the end time prophecies. Uh, noting that Jesus himself said his second coming would be unexpected and unconnected with wars and rumors what? of war. He's taking a quote directly <laughs> from Jesus' prophecy no. and saying something completely contradicting to it. Yeah, Jesus yeah. actually said that would be one of the signs and, of the end. And so this journalist, you know, is, is, is asking Russell Moore, you know, what do you say about Pat Robertson? And he says, no, Jesus said wars is unconnected with his comings. Like, but well, Jesus himself said in Matthew 24, this is the case. That's correct. You know, and, and so this is always the thing, you know, um, futurism is misleading a lot of people. But now we see this balancing occurring with the other extreme because people can see, oh, yes. no, that doesn't make sense. And then they're on the very far end where mm -hmm. they deny what Jesus had said himself. Yeah, so there's two sides of the ditch. It continues, it's not consistent with the Bible, he said, and it's harmful to the witness of the church, said Moore, noting that the world has outlived many episodes of end time speculations. Mm -hmm. And now... This is uh, a map by David Jeremiah illustrating what they believe Russia's role will be mm. in end time Bible prophecy. And if you zoom into it, you can see that they have Magog on one side there, Libya, Ethiopia, mm -hmm. Israel, and Gomar. So we're going to see, is that biblical? Mm. Yes. You know, if we go to one of the most popular sites on the Internet, um, Got Questions, uh, the question is asked, does the Bible say anything about Russia in relation to the end times? And they, this is their conclusion. So, yes, the Bible does mention Russia, although not by that name in connection with the end times. Ezekiel 38 to 39 definitely referred to a nation coming from northern Asia to attack Israel. After the Cold War, Russia lost its superpower status, making the fulfillment of Ezekiel's prophecy seem unlikely in some people's eyes. However, hmm. recent events have shown that Russia is gaining strength, and many believe that the invasion of Ukraine is just a first step 
in Russia's plan to restore its dominance in that hemisphere. It is also interesting to note that in the Soviet era, mm. Moscow was solidly aligned with several Muslim countries in opposition to Israel. Since the breakup of the Soviet Union, Russia has continued to make overtures to the Muslim world. According to the Bible, there will come a time when Russia, in alliance with several other countries, will amass a huge army against Israel. And so you can see, yes, there's sometimes some speculation, but overall they agree mm -hmm. that Magog refers you know, to, to Russia and that it will attack Israel at some point. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and this will help culminate this world to this point where the Antichrist can come, which will lead to Armageddon eventually. And, you know, many of the interpreters, you know, see Gog as this leader of Russia. And so, you know, we can go on and on. You know, I can show you many, many theologians, preachers, pastors, even so-called prophets like Ben Heen, the last few mm -hmm. weeks, you know, going on about Ezekiel 38 and 39. And believers are now waiting for the rapture. Don't miss the next episode. We'll look at the rapture and even the rapture index. And is that biblical or not? But what does the people say? Section 2. People's Perspective. A coalition of nations led by Russia and Iran, they're going to come together and they're going to attack Israel. But let's come to the situation in the Ukraine. So many Bible scholars believe in Ezekiel 38, as it speaks of Magog attacking Israel, that that is modern day Russia. I could go and talk about that for, you know, 30 minutes, why they believe that's true. I happen to agree with them. But it says in Ezekiel that the Jewish people will be scattered and regathered in our land again. We know uh, during World War II, after the Holocaust, Jewish people from around the planet began to return to their land. And Israel officially became a nation on May 14, 1948. So that part of the prophecy has been fulfilled. But then scripture says a nation from the extreme north of Israel will march on her called Gog and Magog. If you look on any map, you'll see that is the geographical area of Russia. They often talked about the army to the north, and I think Rosh was the, was the word that was used in yes. the original language of the Bible. Is that Russia, and should we be paying attention to what's happening with Russia and with Ukraine in light of Bible prophecy? Yeah, I think we should. Uh, the word, yeah, the word Rosh there, Rosh, is used in Ezekiel 38 and 39. You know, a lot of people thought that when the Soviet Union fell apart that, you know, that was all over with. Well, the bear has come roaring out of hibernation. We You're not say. kidding. You're not kidding. And, and that's not an accident. I think we see that happening in conjunction with all these other things taking place in the world. I think it's a, a significant event that's setting the stage. And you're Section 3, Theological Perspective. Our guest today with us is Werner Eiselen. He's from South Africa. He's a pastor, a theologian, and also a scientist. And he's really, you know, um, into detail. So this topic we've seen uh, under the world events, you know, concerning some of the pastors like Pat Robertson, um, David Jeremiah, that says that dispensationalism, you know, is showing us what is happening in the world and to understand it better you know, is quite a question mark and is quite problematic. And so we want to ask Werner today, you know, what does the Bible say about the Gog and Magog? Um, because we just saw that many of these um, spiritual leaders, these pastors, these, these preachers says and claims that Magog especially is referring to Russia. Some says Gog or some says Rosh. It just depends on who is doing the interpretation. But all of them agree on this one fact. And this is that Russia will attack Israel. And all of this is based on a dispensationalism that we will get into late in this program. But we want to ask our guest today, you know, is it biblical to interpret Gog and Magog as referring to Russia and then eventually Russia attacking Israel. Werner, thank you so much for coming onto this program today. Thank you, Reinhardt. It's my privilege to be able to do so. Hello to all those who are watching this program. Um, please turn with me in your Bibles to Ezekiel 38. And we'll, we'll just have a quick look at the text in question. I'm reading from the New American Standard. 
I have the King James with me as well. Um, but in, in the, the, the Ezekiel 38 in the, in the um, New American Standard, it says, The word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, set your face towards Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Now, I'm just going to pause at that point and to say that since, uh, well, for many years, then it, this has been linked to Russia just on grounds of phonetics, because Rush, Rosh sounds like Russia, and that there's a link has been made between Meshach and Moscow, between Tubal and Tobolsk. And it, it, this is not the way in which one does, one, one gains understanding from the Bible. On, of saying that it sounds the same in a different language. That simply does. Transliteration is not the way to understanding. This is an error which was made by Ronald Reagan in the 80s. It's an error which was made by George Bush uh, in, in, in the 2000s, where they claimed that each one differently, Bush claiming that, uh, that, that Magog is Iraq and Reagan claiming that it is, that it, uh, that it is Russia. It doesn't work to try to with transliteration to gain an understanding. The Bible has to explain itself. And there's a very interesting reference which we find in the Bible. If you turn with me to Jeremiah 51. Jeremiah 51. Then there's a statement which is in, in, in the New American Standard. It says in verse 1, Behold, I'm going to rouse against Babylon and against the inhabitants of Leb Kamai, the spirit of a destroyer. Now, Leb Kamai is not a phrase which is easily understood in the, in the, in, in the King James translation. Then that same verse reads, I will raise it up against Babylon and against them that dwell in the midst of them that rise up against me, a destroying wind. So now we have Leb Kamai in the New American Standard. In the King James, it says, the midst of them that rise up against me. There's got to be something else going on here than what we immediately see. Now, jumping to archaeology. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, then there's a book which is called the Book of Hagu. And the, the, then it's, it, it's comprised of three Hebrew letters. But the Book of Hagu doesn't make any sense in and of itself. However, if one were to take the opposite Hebrew letter, so instead of taking the first, you take the last. Instead of taking the second from the second letter, you take the second last. Then it switches around, and then you have what's called the book of Saraf, which means the test book or the book of, 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 of being proven, a proof book. Now it makes sense. Now we have a key to say something is, something is happening here. This verse, 50, um, verse 1 of Jeremiah 51, if one applies the same procedure with Lev Kamai, then you get Kaldi. Then Lev Kamai becomes Kasdim, which is the Hebrew, which is the Hebrew as we translated for the, for the Chaldees. In Jeremiah 26, then there's another version of this. Excuse me, not Jeremiah 26, Jeremiah 25. In Jeremiah 25, there's a list of a whole range of kings. And it starts in verse 19 of Jeremiah 25 with Pharaoh. And then it goes on to the land of the Philistines. And it speaks of Edom and Moab and the sons of Ammon and the king of Ty and the kings of Sidon. Uh, the, and Dedan, Timah, Buz, and all who cut the corners of their hair, the kings of Arabia, all the kings of Zimri, the kings of Elam, the kings of Media, all the kings of the north. And then lastly it says, and the king of Sheshach shall drink after them. Now here's a question for those who are taking Bible, biblical prophecy seriously. Where's Babylon? Where's Babylon in all of this? If you were to do, apply the same test to the word Sheshach, if you take, instead of taking the first, you take the last and you turn it around, then it becomes Babel. Now, here's an interesting story, which I'm just going to add. When I want to go for a walk with my dogs, then I can't say 
that I'm going to do that. I have to use code, as it were, to communicate with my family, to say, this is what we're going to do. And in my language, then I would say, ons gaan nou gaan stop. But if I say that, the dogs will hear the word stop, which is walk in Afrikaans, and they would, they, then, then they get extremely excited and start barking. So then I would say, we're going to go S-T-A-P. We're going to go W-A-L-K. And those who understand the code will immediately follow. Jeremiah is making his statements within the place of where Babel can act against him. Ezekiel is writing in, within the same context. Therefore, the need for saying it somewhat differently. Now here to the point of what we're speaking about today. Magog. If one applies the same to Magog, but then you, you, you reverse it, and then it's not that you take the, the, the opposite letter, you take the preceding letter, then it becomes Babel. And this is not something which I came up with. Please, no, I don't want anyone to think is that, 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 that uh, this is new ground which I'm breaking or it's new light. This is old. This is old. This is, was published in the, in the year which I was born. Then this was published. And it, it, it's common knowledge amongst biblical students that that's actually how it fits together. Is that Babel uh, is, is, is referred to as Magog. If one puts one hand at Ezekiel 37, 38, and you put another hand at Revelation 20, then you see a range of astounding parallels. And this is actually, this, this is startling if you see this. In Ezekiel 37, then there's a valley of dry bones and they live again. Now in there's a first resurrection which, which is referred to in Revelation 20, verses 4 to 6. Shortly after that, there's a reference to, to uh, nations on all sides. And you have the nations on all sides again in Revelation 20. Uh, following that, then there's, uh, within both Ezekiel 38 and Revelation 20, there's a massive attack which takes place. There are, there's a, a hail and earthquakes which take place in both the after the death of the enemies of God, then they are eaten by birds in both accounts. Therefore, there's a parallel in the account, which is startling. Even if one does not use this method of um, determining the identity of a cipher, the concept is referred to as atbash. Uh, if those for those that are interested and the, the atbash gets its name from the first letter in the hebrew alphabet is aleph and the last is tau so if you substitute the the, the aleph with the t with, with the tau that's the at part and bash then refers to the second and the second last letter which is a bait and a shin so you substitute the aleph for the tau you substitute the bait for the shin and suddenly then you have code language which is in the bible I hasten to say is that this is not something which is used all over the place. If one is now going to go through the Bible looking for secret code which the Lord is communicating in, that's not there. That's not there. Prophecy is made clear to the servants of God. And that's the promise which we have in Amos 3 verse 7. That the Lord does nothing without letting his servants, the prophets, know. The, this particular question of Magog and Babel and she she Sheshach and Babel is a very interesting phenomenon. And this does destroy the argument that we are staring Armageddon in the face. And that the final destruction in Revelation 20 is actually going to take place now around physical Jerusalem. That's not the case. The Bible is clear. We need to leave Babylon. And, and so it makes sense because what you are stating is that this was done on purpose because the context, you know, of Jeremiah and Ezekiel in those times were, you know, they were under the regime of Babylon. And, um, you know, it was, they didn't have free speech like most of us today in you know, Western countries. And so they had to use code language. Is that what you are telling us? In, in, in a certain sense, that's exactly that. That's exactly that. So that it is then, it, that it requires some, some thinking to be able to get to 
the answer. Okay. And for our listeners, we are not stating here that all of Scripture is in code, but when you compare this to the rest of Scripture, like you just did with the book of Revelation, you see that this fits perfectly in the greater narrative of prophecy and the greater overview of prophecy this fits perfectly but when you do what many of today's preachers are doing you know and just taking the words like rush and say it is russia or magog is russia you you ran into problems and because you want to physically interpret it literally um, and just impose it on anything happening today and we've seen this over the last 40 years. You know, you, you mentioned Reagan. And so since then, a lot of evangelical leaders have done this over the years. Every time Russia gives any, you know, sound, makes any sound, make any threats, you know, they are back to this prophecy. And what we will discover later in this podcast, this is all part of dispensationalism. And the very premise of dispensationalism is faulty it's not biblical we will show it to you that in a minute and so i really thank you for this insight it is valuable it makes sense and in the greater uh, narrative of prophecy it fits perfectly it's it's my privilege it took me a while to understand the whole concept myself so if some of the viewers feel that it's a little bit rushed my apologies for that um there's the and then a, a study of revelation 20 in comparison with uh, Ezekiel 37 to 39 the parallels are very clear and it's startling and the conclusion must be that this refers to a time in the future after the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and it's not something which is going to happen now with literal Russia yes wow that's wonderful thank you so much for that insight may God bless you and, and thanks for sharing it with us today Thank you for the privilege. Blessings to you. Section 4. Prophetic Perspective All right, so now we're getting into our prophetic perspective, and we're going to give a little overview of the previous podcast. So the previous episode, we looked at historicism, and this is basically the idea that the prophecies that were given are not just for one time in the past or one time in the future, but throughout the mm -hmm. the history of mankind, from, from the time of the authors all mm -hmm. the way down till the end of time. We also look at looked at preterism, which is that prophecies were fulfilled around the author's day and way back in the past. So all those uh, apocalyptic prophecies, they all were already fulfilled, either in a time of Christ or in the time of the authors, like in Daniel's time, for example. But then the next interpretation of apocalyptic prophecies is futurism. Uh, and this states that all these prophecies that are in the apocalypse, that they are future, meaning that they are all towards the end of time. And we looked at that that, that specifically, according to them, is in three and a half years uh, in the end days mm -hmm. where prophecies are fulfilled. But it bypassed the history mm -hmm. of um, the church throughout the dark ages. And it's basically locking up prophecy. Um, when these two different ideas of well, the first one, preterism, the other one, futurism, basically bypasses uh, the 1260-year prophecy that God gave to us to reveal the man of sin, the son of perdition. In other words, the little horn power or the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is diverging the attention from mm -hmm. the Antichrist being the papal power and taking it and sticking it either in the past and giving mm -hmm. other people that title or in the future, at some future mm -hmm. time, um, where this Antichrist will mm -hmm. rise up. In today's podcast, we're going to look at futurism and you know just have a short overview and then we're going to get to dispensationalism. And some people will ask, you know, what's the difference? Yeah. Um, Dispensationalism forms the basis for the popular futurist interpretation method, you know, of many people today and many scholars, theologians, you know, preachers, pastors, etc. Yes. And so uh, when we speak about futurism, we are basically speaking about pre-tribulation dispensationalism. Um, you know, you get mid-trip and, you know, post-trip and there's a lot of, mm. you know, but this is the most popular one. And so futurism places the prophecies way in the future. 
And dispensationalism is the basis how to understand, you know, the plan of God through the ages. And then at the end of the dispensations, the last two dispensations, how God will work in the end times, you know, through futurism and end time events. And so in order to understand this, let's just do a short historical overview of futurism. If you can remember, the Catholic Church wanted to get rid of this Antichrist label, you mm -hmm. know, that they were labeled with by the reformers. Right. And so and it was a biblical label because they studied exactly. it out and they were able to find exactly. it. Exactly. So they tasked two Jesuits yes. to come up with, you know, new methods of interpretation. And so there was Alcazar that came up with preterism and Ribera came up with futurism. And Ribera wrote, you know, a lot of things about how to, to understand the prophecies far in the future. Mm -hmm. And then a few years after that, like two centuries or more, there was another Jesuit in South America. His name was Manuel de la Cunza. He read this works of Ribera mm -hmm. and he was inspired. Mm. And so he then set forth um, to study it more deeply. And he came to the conclusion, wow, there's actually much more depth to this. And he wrote a book. Um, there you can see the, the book. Um, and that English title is The Coming of the Messiah in Majesty and Glory. He wrote it under the name Juan Josephat Ben Ezra. And he published it in South America. And slowly this book found its way to different parts of the world. Different people will be influenced by this eventually. One of those would be Edward Irving. He lived in Scotland. He was a Scottish Presbyterian, and he translated this book. He was so inspired, he translated it. The mm. Coming of the Messiah and Majesty and Glory into English. And so eventually, later on, uh, John Nelson Darby found this book in the U.S., and he studied this book, yeah. and he was convinced that this is truth, mm. and he became the father of dispensationalism here in the U.S.A., and he wrote about this and he made maps and charts you know uh, charts and you know he would influence some other people eventually like let me show you this book many of the concepts and theories today of this dispensationalism is built on all these charts by clarence larkin this is a very old book um this is more than a century old um there's a lot of maps and charts in this book. And you can even go to the website today, even Clarence Larkin, and go to all these drawings. You can buy the maps. You know, these books have been reprinted so much. It is just incredible. And so uh, from Irving to Derby, the system was slowly built and developed. And from Derby, you know, Schofield got mm. his information from Derby. And then he set out, you know, I need to make this simple for the public. Hmm. And he got an idea. Let me put it in the Bible because everyone has a Bible. Not everyone's going to buy my book. Right. And I'm going to make some notes at the end, you know, uh, mm -hmm. at the bottom of all the verses and, and explain end time prophecy. And so this is exactly what he did. But not just end time prophecy. This whole model of dispensationalism how God works and saves mankind throughout the ages. And so Cyrus Ingerson Schofield was the author of the popular Schofield Reference Bible. There you can see the Bible on the screen. Millions of copies have been printed and sold. Even mm. to this very day, it is still a popular Bible. Uh, and I need to say this. I won't go into those details today. It has been revised a few times. Because some of the statements, you know, people could easily pick at it and the whole theory could fall apart. And so mm -hmm. they had to, you know, uh, wiggle it a bit, you know. Um, but that's something for another day. It's very interesting. Eventually, the Moody Bible Institute, you know, uh, was established and they were were real proponents of futurism, you okay. know. And they have influenced many theologians um, because of their teaching that studied there, especially the last more than 100 years. And so there's the Moody Bible Institute in Chicago many years ago. And there it is also in the previous century. And then also there it is how it's looking today. It's They have a huge influence. They are very conservative. 
and you know nothing wrong with it they have a, they have a lot of good material but and here's the but they have been instrumental of confusing people when it comes to prophecy. apocalyptic prophecy mm -hmm. now one of the people that were influenced were lewis sperry schaefer he eventually uh, became a theologian and also the author of the popular eight-volume systematic books for theologians. There you can see the original books. Um, I have them in my collection, in a four-volume collection. It's an incredible work, but what he does is he, he works the principles of futurism and dispensationalism throughout his systematic theology. And so now... Uh, when it gets to God or Christ or the work of the Holy Spirit or the church, all these principles are worked into that. And so mm. you are directly influenced by it. Now, um, Schaefer founded the Dallas Theological Seminary. And he served as the first president of the Dallas Theological Seminary and was an influential supporter of dispensationalism. And so the very foundation of the seminary is dispensationalism. It's been taught in all their theological subjects, and this is the way that it is brought across. And this has influenced many popular preachers the last yeah. more than 70 years, especially, right. that have been on radio and TV, that have been popular authors, like Hal Lindsey, for instance. He graduated from Dallas Theological Seminary, and in 1970, he published this very popular book, The Late Great Planet Earth. Here you can see the book. It, it's, it has sold more than 30 million copies mm. in 30 languages. You know, it is just incredible. And it's a very simple book. But what it does is, it is showing that Israel, you know, is going to play a part. And um, the rapture will soon take place. And just look here yeah russia, russia. <laughs> and gog and magog yeah here it is the mm -hmm. same things this was 1970 and so it caught the world by storm especially the usa and many preachers were influenced by this book it's just incredible one of them being tim lahay and so tim lahay came many years after this and said you know we we've put this into the bible we wrote popular books but we need to, to get the attention of the average person on the street. How will mm -hmm. we do it? Fiction. Mm -hmm. And he, he came up with this fictional plot of end time events and how it will happen. And he wrote storybooks, you know, fictional books called Left Behind Books. Here is Tim LaHaye and his co-author Jerry B. Jenkins. And they have co-authored this series of 16 books since 1995. And the last book appeared in 2007, Left Behind, going through everything they believed will happen in the end times based on dispensationalism uh, with a very focus of the secret rapture. Don't miss the next episode. And after they have written these books, you know, they thought to themselves, how can we get it more to the public's attention? Right. Let's get it to the kids. And let's make kids books and this is exactly what they did they wrote these books for kids they adapted it made it more simple mm -hmm. and now your child can read all about futurism and how it will play off in the end times um it's very exciting you know? yeah. it's very exciting but oh. is it truth it's not truth you know this is the question and so after the books came the movies and in 2008, this movie came out by Kirk Cameron, Left Behind. Then there's, there was the, the second one in 2002, and then the third one in 2005. And everything was focused on the secret rapture and the Antichrist to come and the tribulation. And eventually, it, it was made into uh, video, video games, games and PC games. There's a whole trilogy of that. And in 2014, Hollywood caught on and said, hey, there's money in this, in, in, in this fiction, this Bible fiction. Mm. And they had Nicolas Cage as the star of the blockbuster film called Left, Left Behind. Behind. And, you know, he, he's a pilot in this movie. And then people are raptured and it's just chaos on this planet. You know, as cars crash, you know, crash into shops, planes go down. People die, run around, 
and what is going to happen when the rapture takes place it is just crazy and brother all of this yes. mayhem all of this fiction yeah is based on this foundation of dispensationalism, dispensationalism. that there is basically seven different dispensations from creation until the very end of time how God deals and works with people and how he saves them throughout yeah. time. And this then creates this narrative mm. of futurism. Why? And we will still look at, you know, at it in future episodes. But here's the main premise. If you look at, at it on the screen, for those listening, please listen now carefully. The first dispensation, as they call it, is the dispensation of innocence. This was before sin. Then the dispensation of conscience. This was before the flood. Then the dispensation of government. This is after the flood. Then the dispensation of promise. This is Abram to the Exodus. Then the dispensation of law. This is after the Exodus. The rest of the Old Testament. And then the dispensation of grace. This is the church period. Or some call it the dispensation of the church. This is from Jesus. We are still in the, the grace dispensation according to futurists. And then eventually get the kingdom dispensation um, where eternity will, you know, be brought in by Jesus. And so these dispensations, very interesting, because what they do is they group these dispensations that the dispensation of um, government, promise and law, this brought uh, about Israel. Mm. God made covenants and promises to Abraham and Israel and God will, and those promises are still intact. And so to them, Israel will still be God's people, are still God's people, will still mm. play a role in all the prophecies that are given in the Old Testament. And so they will be a role player in the end time. And then you have the church and the grace period, and they will be a role player until they are raptured away. And so when they are raptured away, Israel can come to the mm. front again. And then they are part of the end time events before God can bring about his kingdom. It's like... Hmm. It's the most complicated system on earth when it comes to theology. It is so complicated. But when you get to the foundation, it, it's simple enough that we can study it and see today. Is this it's, biblical yes. or not? And so we'll get into the rapture and the other events that they predict will happen and how they see it happening in the next episode. But for now, we're just going to study dispensationalism and see is this biblical or not? So I want to start with this quote from C.I. Schofield. He said and explained, A dispensation is a period of time during which man is tested in respect to obedience to some specific revelation of the will of God. Okay, so you can see that he explains and defines dispensations as this period where God deals with, in a certain way with humanity mm -hmm. and then the next dispensation a bit differently and then the next dispensation a bit differently where God's uh, will is slowly revealed more and more and so God deals differently with different time periods with mm -hmm. different people very interesting and yeah. well, we need to determine today is this biblical or not and so we can ask this First question about the first dispensation, the dispensation of innocence. Is this biblical or not? What dispensationalism teaches about this? They say the dispensation of innocence, the very first dispensation in which Adam and Eve were in paradise, was the dispensation of innocence because they had no knowledge of good and evil. Now, I wanted to listen to this very carefully. They say, the dispensation says, there was no knowledge of good and evil. Now, mm. this actually says that Adam and Eve was actually primitive. They were wow. so innocent, they didn't know enough. They didn't have enough knowledge. And, you know, this makes it a problem when you compare it to Scripture. Because what does the Bible say? The Bible teaches, in Genesis 1, 26 and 31, and God said, let us make man in our image, yes. after our likeness, and let them have dominion. And did, did Adam and Eve thus know good? 
Of course they did, yes. because they were made in God's image. image. Absolutely. And listen to what God said after creation. And God saw everything, that includes Adam and Eve, mm -hmm. that he had made. And behold, it was what? Very good. Very good. Yeah. And so Adam and Eve was created very good according to God. Beginning, yeah. You know, so they were not these primitive beings, you know, still developing in knowledge. Mm -hmm. They were created perfect in the image of God. And so, you know, we can see that what they say can't be publicly mm -hmm. accurate. So this dispensation of innocence, is that biblical or not? No. Absolutely not. No. Now we're going to the next dispensation, the dispensation of conscience. And we'll see what they say. Uh, basically, they teach that the dispensation of conscience for a long time after the fall of man, man distinguished between good and evil by the voice of his conscience. He had no other precepts to follow. Is that biblical? Let's see what the Bible has to say regarding this. For where no law is, there is no transgression. So that's what's written mm -hmm. in Romans chapter 4, verse 15. Mm -hmm. verse 15. And then mm -hmm. now in the book of Genesis, it says, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Amen. So here we see the Bible teach that grace exists, mm -hmm. you know, way before and way yes. after right great yes. grace is always there Amen. god is gracious mm -hmm. and we also see that the law is mm -hmm. also been there so both this Absolutely. idea of the law and the grace exist right yes. because where no law is mm -hmm. there is no transgression mm. uh and we're also told that in the same by the same author in the book of mm -hmm. romans that the law has a purpose mm -hmm. that the law gives a knowledge of sin. And why this is important, Marlon, is that they say, dispensationalism say that the, 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 the period of law is still future. Yeah. And the period of grace is still future. But here in this period of mm -hmm. um, innocence, innocence you, you, you can't have law mm -hmm. and you can't have grace. Yeah. But Just here the conscience. Bible is clearly telling us yes. there is law, because how could there be law? Mm -hmm. How could there not be law and they be disobedient? Because you mm -hmm. can only be disobedient if there's law. Right. Yep, because where there's no law, as the writer says, uh -huh. there's no sin. Absolutely. Right? How are you going to break the law if there is no law to be broken? Absolutely. Yeah. And so we see that this dispensation of conscience is unbiblical. And so the question is, what about the next dispensation the dispensation of government is that biblical what dispensationalism teaches about this the the dispensation of human governments after the flood after the flood the lord made a covenant with noah and subsequently held the leaders of family groups or peoples responsible for the decisions and the welfare of their followers. Mm. And so, you know, you can now slowly see this yeah. evolving evolutionary development. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, um, it says after the flood, uh -huh. now God is keeping the, the, the leaders responsible right. and the parents responsible for other people's actions. You know, mm -hmm. they follow us actions. Um, because, you know, there's still no Bible, there's still no law, there's still no grace, you know, and God deals now differently. Mm -hmm. What does the Bible say? Deuteronomy 24, 16 says, The fathers shall not be put to death for the children, neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own, own sin. sin. And here the Bible now says very clearly that we will be responsible for ourselves before God for our own sin. This is after the flood. Yep. And you can clearly see that God deals fairly with everyone on the same level in every age. In all ages. Now, we, we just looked at the dispensation of the government. Is that biblical? No. No, that's not biblical. Now we're going to move on to the dispensation of promise mm -hmm. and see what that says and then if it's biblical or not. The dispensation of promise. In this dispensation, because God makes so many promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they are tested 
saved by their faithfulness to the promise and covenant. Mm. That's what they teach. Now, let's see what the Bible teaches. In Genesis chapter 26, verse 5, the Bible says, Because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Amen. So we see that the laws of God mm -hmm. was there in a time of Abraham, mm -hmm. Isaac, and Jacob. And they were faithful when they obeyed. Yes, and, and now we're going to see that only after Abram comes the dispensation of law. Mm -hmm. But even while Abram was there, there's there was the dispensation law. of law. Mm -hmm. You know, there was law. And, you know, so what we clearly see is that, you know, this is this is not in harmony with Scripture. With scripture. No, they're taking it and chopping it up however mm -hmm. they want, but that's not what we see in the narrative of the Bible. No, and so clearly this dispensation of promise is unbiblical because there's even law in this age. Then we come to the dispensation of law. Okay, this is now after the Exodus. What dispensationalism teaches about this? Dispensation of the law, according to them, at Sinai, the dispensation of the law began, in which the distinction between good and evil was much more explicitly stated. And now we can see this is, we've already read the verses yeah. clearly where there's law in Abram's time, That's you know, right. even at the very beginning. Yeah. But now they say, now this is the first time where law appears. Mm -hmm. Until now, no one exactly explicitly knew what's wrong and right. Isn't that crazy? That is crazy. Think about Cain and Abel right after the exactly. fall. You know, the, the brother killed the other brother. And they knew it was a murder. How could they knew if there was no <laughs> law? Right. And no. so, Confusion. what does the Bible teach? The Bible says in Titus 2 verse 11, For the grace of God. That bring the salvation hath appeared to all oh, men. Man. This this is stretching it from the beginning to the very end of time that God's grace hath appeared. Now, why do I read the scripture? Because they say that in this dispensation of law, there's no grace. Grace is still coming in the church period when Jesus comes. There's no grace now in this law dispensation. But the Bible teaches us yes. God's grace stretches throughout all time, from the beginning to the very end. And Psalms 51 11 says. David prays, cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. They teach that in this next period of grace, the church age, only then is the Holy Spirit present, not before. But here the Bible says in, David, in, in David's lifetime, in David's life, he ask, he's asking of God, don't take the Holy Spirit from me. Hmm. Which means that there's Holy Spirit in the age of the law, in this dispensation of law. Right. Now we just looked at the dispensation of the law. Is that biblical? No. No, that's not biblical. Now we're going to move forward to the dispensation of grace. Hmm. We'll see what they define it to be. What dispensationalism teaches. The dispensation of grace is also called the dispensation of the church or the Holy Spirit. After the crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit was poured out to restore people and guide them into all truth. What does dispensationalism teach? They basically take Romans chapter 6, verse 14. It says, For ye are not under law, but under grace. And we hear that a lot mm -hmm, in, in, mm -hmm. when you, if you ever uh, uh, yes. minister to someone yes. else from, from a different faith. So if we, we are not under law, but under grace. And they leave it there. Mm -hmm. But what does the Bible teach? Let's look at this verse in its full context. Mm. So if you look at Romans chapter 6 and you look at verse 14 and 15, let's read what it says. For sin shall not have dominion over you. Yes. Why? For ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Amen. So what Paul is saying yes. is that as a Christian, under grace, saved by grace, mm -hmm. through faith, that do you now make void the law? Is the law nailed to the cross? Mm -hmm. Or do we as Christians keep the law? Mm -hmm. He says, God forbid that we would say that we don't mm -hmm. keep the law. 
All right, and the Bible continues in John chapter 14, verse 15. Jesus says, if you love me, mm. keep my commandments. Mm. So this idea that this under this dispensation that we're under grace, we no longer need to worry about the mm -hmm. law is not biblical. Mm. And first of all, no one can keep the law of God without love in their heart. Amen. Towards him. You know, we're told in Romans chapter 8, mm. verse 7, that the carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither mm. it indeed can be. So... Yes, you are saved by grace, and mm. grace gives you the power to mm. keep the law of God. So we have another scripture here, John 15, verse 10 says, If you keep my commandments, mm. you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. And this is Jesus speaking. Mm. And according to them, in this time period would have been the dispensation of the law. Yes. Right? And he's saying that he kept the commandments when he was on earth. Absolutely. And so when he comes, now there's this transition to grace. And so as he comes, they say, okay, yeah, but he was a Jew. But still, you know, it's starting the grace period. And so mm. some of them uh, have the period of grace start with when Jesus comes. And some of them, because this is a challenge to them, they move it on a, with his ascension when he pours out the Holy Spirit. Gotcha. Now they say, okay, <laughs> the Holy Spirit is poured out. Mm -hmm. Jesus is not now the stumbling block when, as he keeps the law. Mm -hmm. He's now in heaven. This is now the, the period of grace. grace. And so let's say it is from uh, yeah. the Holy Spirit's outpouring. Uh, does Jesus' words not apply anymore? Mm. And what do you do with later writings? Exactly. You know, and this is an example of a later writing, John 5, First so John chapter 5, verse 3, mm -hmm. by the beloved John. He wrote, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. Amen. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 3. Yes. And so we see that grace and mm -hmm. the law exist through eternity. Yes. And here we see that God is telling us that when we keep his commandments mm -hmm. as Christians, we're saved by grace through mm -hmm. faith. That is not a grievous thing. We are Amen. empowered to do it. It's, been, it's a blessing to not murder, kill, mm -hmm. steal, and do all those bad things. Amen. And so we see clearly that grace, this dispensation of grace, so-called, is unbiblical. Uh, but what about this dispensation of kingdom, according to this dispensationalist view? What dispensationalism teaches, the dispensation of the kingdom in the millennial reign, true believers of all times will reign with Christ in his kingdom. And so here is a graph to show you very clearly. Um, this, if you remember the seven dispensations, now if you take the last two, the, the dispensation of grace and kingdom, mm -hmm. there's a split between the two. And the split is end time events according to futurist viewpoint. Okay, so what they believe is that we are living now in the dispensation of grace. Okay, and I've not forgotten gotten about this question is the dispensation of kingdom biblical or not we'll get to that in a moment but I, I, I first want to take us to this they say that we live in this grace dispensation and they believe that at any moment we can be raptured the church will be raptured and true believers those who firmly believe in Jesus will be raptured away and that will be the catalyst that will set at work end time events. Because the church is removed, now evil can just take over, and the Antichrist, you know, will come, you'll be revealed, you know, the temple the, in Jerusalem will be rebuilt, and the seals will be poured out. And so that what they believe is Revelation 4 to 19 will now take place between these two dispensations. And so we'll see the period of tribulation for three and a half years, and then the Antichrist will reveal himself in the temple, and he will rule the world. It will just be an evil time. It will be a, a time of tribulation has never been on this world. The trumpets will take place, then the plagues will take place, and then Jesus will come for the third time. Okay? Um, so they split the second coming text in Scripture into two. And so you have the secret rapture, and then you have a third coming of Jesus, and then he will bring the church... It's a very, there's a lot of other detail I'm just leaving out. And then the kingdom age will begin. Another question is, is this biblical? Now, my answer is, don't miss the next episode. <laughs> we don't have time to get into that today, but I can tell you, we will find 
that this is also unbiblical and all the events in between these two so-called dispensations. And so we look at these events and we will find that it is unbiblical. And so please don't miss it. If you believe in the rapture, if you believe in these things, please hear us out. Please study yes. it for yourself and listen to what we have to say. We're going to make it very simple in the next podcast and you will see with your own eyes. Absolutely. Be like the Bereans. Amen. Search these things and see if Amen. they're so. Section 5. Perspective of Hope. All right, so as far as our perspective of hope in Matthew 24, and I'm going to turn there. So in Matthew chapter 24, I'm going to look at verses 1 to verses 4. Mm -hmm. It says, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. His disciples came to him for to show him the building of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that mm -hmm. shall not be thrown down. So now Jesus told them this specific thing about mm -hmm. this temple. And to them, this seems like this would be yes. the, it must be the end of the world. Yes. So now it continues in verse three. It says, and as he sat upon the mountain of olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, tell us. When shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? They wanted to know what's going to happen in the end of the world. Uh, and Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed mm -hmm. that no man deceive you. Mm -hmm. So this gives us hope, Reinhardt, mm -hmm. because as we see so much deception, mm -hmm. even in Christianity, Christianity have been hijacked mm -hmm. and things that should not be in the Bible, have been brought into the Bible as far yes. as how to interpret it, yes. and especially the apocalyptic prophecies, mm -hmm. which should be a light to guide mm -hmm. us in these last days. They have been a means of mm -hmm. deception. So I'm grateful that God has given us a more sure word to help Amen. us to um, see where we are and what mm -hmm. we should be doing. Absolutely. And, and the thing is, Marlon, now... We have Antichrist teachings yes. uh, taught in Protestant churches about these prophecies. And now it is just all explained away about the Antichrist. We don't know who it is. Yes. It was maybe someone in the past or it will be someone in the future. Be not deceived. Mm -hmm. You know, this is what we should recognize that Jesus warned us That's about absolutely. this. And we should take his warning seriously. Yeah. So while the focus of prophecy is not the beast, mm -hmm. he's not the Antichrist, Amen. he also gave it to us mm -hmm. for a reason, so that yes. we won't be deceived. Amen. His name. And so as we turn to Luke chapter 21, I want to share verse 36. You know, this is the advice that Jesus gives us. You know, he just told us, you know, be not de be deceived. Right. You know, don't be deceived. But... The question is now how? Yeah. That's and he important. gives us the advice how. In verse 36, it says, Watch ye therefore, pray always, that ye may be accounted worthy to escape. Mm. All, All these, these things. things. That includes deception. That's right. How to interpret prophecy. Watch and pray. You should study for yourself to show yourself a proof. Amen. Don't go, you know, according to what someone else has said or written. It's according to what the Bible says. We should study for ourselves. Watch and pray that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Mm. I want to stand before Jesus and I want to be saved. Yes. But we need to know the Bible predicted, and we saw it in our last podcast, Daniel 7.25, the Antichrist will think to change times. times. He will change prophecy. Mm-hmm. So if we don't want to be deceived, we need to study for ourselves. And this gives me hope, Marlon. Amen. Because we can stand before Jesus yes. if we study and pray, if we read for ourselves. Watch and pray. This is the key. This gives us hope because no one, and we just saw it in Deuteronomy 24, yeah. We have personal responsibility. personal responsibility. We can't say, but, oh, my pastor taught me this, and I'm so sorry I was mm. deceived. No, we should study for ourselves. Yeah. Be not deceived. So thank you so much for tuning in today. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, Stitcher, and many other platforms. Please share it with your friends. If you can, please review or rate us. 
Yeah, when you view us on YouTube, please leave a comment. Please share it with your friends. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram. And this way we can make sure that many more people can listen to this podcast. Absolutely. And if you want to get in touch with us, feel free to email us at info at propheticperspective.org. Or you can visit our website at propheticperspective.org mm -hmm. or on Telegram. Mm -hmm. Is the secret rapture true or fallacy? That's the topic for our next episode. Can't miss it. Mm -hmm. Please tune in. Thank you so much for tuning in. Let's end with a word of prayer. Father, what a wonderful privilege that we could study your word. Thank you, Father, that your word always, always leads us to truth. Yes. And Father, thank you for Jesus and his promise that he will be with us and that he is giving us advice to watch and pray, to study for ourselves. And Father, we just pray for everyone listening today that you will guide their minds to truth, to Jesus. Father, that we may cling to your way of understanding prophecy as the men of old have done. And Father, that we will stand amid a world that is in apostasy, even church that is in apostasy, yes. that have left your truth and your prophecies. Oh, Father, we pray that you may give us wisdom and insight, and may we continually be drawing nearer to Jesus, the bright morning star of prophecy. We prayed in his name alone. Amen.